Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon, USA area. For your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind of individuals and about whatever it is that we decided to talk about this evening. And you find it very intriguing talking to my guest, uh, Kevin Fitz, uh, about so much stuff to do with mental health and those kinds of things. Uh, how are you doing? Good. I'm doing good. Good. Thanks for having me. Feeling good? Yes. Yeah. Are you nervous? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Not as much as I am. Well, it's hard to tell because you put up a good front. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is going to be a good show. <laughs> yeah. So as you know, the show goes in two major parts. And the first part can be 15 minutes or 45 minutes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Second part is the subject of the show. Okay. Uh, a consumer-centered mental health policy is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's just get started here. Uh, personal stuff. If I were to ask your best friend, who is Kevin, what would your best friend say? Be your be best friend. Kevin is? He is a advocate for uh, those with mental and emotional disabilities. Uh-huh. With lived experience. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready for the add on part. And when and where were you born? I was born in Eugene, Oregon oh, at Oregon. Sacred Heart Hospital. Uh -huh. uh, March 26 at 6.15 p.m., 1965, the year of our Lord. You remember it well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's like I was almost there, primarily. <laughs> Why were you born? Um, I'm not sure because the doctors told my mother, don't have any other children. She already had two, two daughters, and they said, we don't think your body will be able to, ha you'll be able to have another uh, child. Uh -huh. I was premature five to six weeks premature, and mm. born with severe epiglottitis. Epiglottis. Yes. They're swollen up. Yeah. I was having tr problems breathing, and the f they kept me over, uh, I think, for two days in the hospital because I was having problems breathing right out of the chute. Yeah. And you survived that. I did, yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> How many brain cells would I have had started out with if I wasn't oxygen deprived early on, Dr. Don? <laughs> Uh, anything significant about your racial, national, or cultural heritage that the, uh, the viewers might be interested in? Not particularly. Okay. Not, not, n nothing that I even particularly knew about or paid attention about to, you know, as a, as a toddler and a young child, nothing. We, you know, grew up in Lane County and then Benton County and then moved to Redding, California and so not not particularly. It was only when we moved into the Midwest that we started to understand, you know, the impact of different cultures and the impact of poverty. Because mm -hmm. in Milwaukee, outside of Milwaukee and outside of St. Louis, that was uh, that was kind of a culture shock. Do you have any idea how intelligent you are in the IQ uh, testing? Uh, which your IQ? It's hard to know. Uh, my mother claims that she had it tested and it was um, 142 when I was in fifth grade. And my father said, that's nonsense. We never had you tested. There's no way that your IQ is The reason is I, I ask is because <laughs> it's a fun thing from my days when I was practicing. Right. Before I administer my batteries, right. I'd have about five minutes with the patient or the client and make a guesstimate. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. then administer the test and say, God, dog, oh, okay. I nailed it ahead right, of that. Right. Within five uh, points, you know. Right, right. But yeah, you're un unusually bright. Above room temperature, I think I probably. <laughs> <laughs> Delightful. It was fun for me is because then I'm able to, because of my little uh, higher than average, uh -huh. I'm, I'm smart enough to know when somebody's smarter than me, so I don't get in the competition because I'm going to lose. Oh, and uh -huh. I don't like uh -huh. losing. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. But it's, it's fun to t t talk with somebody who's very, very bright. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And you, were you Catholic? Episcopalian. In a Catholic hospital? Yeah, Episcopalian. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was the general hospital down there. That was the hospital. That was the main hospital in Eugene in 1965, Sacred Heart Hospital. Oh. Yeah. They didn't have an Episcopal hospital. Okay. Yeah. And so, do you have a religious preference today? Um, I identify as a um, a person who is particularly interested in a Zen Buddhist approach to living. 
uh, with a secular focus. But I also encourage and like to explore was, you know, some of the hi history of early Christianity, the idea of Jesus as a radical uh, preacher preaching about poverty and class and inclusion. Some of that I find somewhat intriguing, but I'm not particularly taken by ideas of supernatural human beings or um, m uh, miracles from the sky. Mm -hmm. Did you study Buddhism? I attend, I read an awful lot of Buddhist uh, te texts, listen to podcasts of Buddhism, try to do some Zen Buddhist meditation here in the Portland, in the Portland area previously. Um, it, Zen Buddhist teachings what got me into working in hospice as a hospice volunteer. Uh -huh. So, but I was never a disciplined, I'm a lazy, uh, un, um, undocu un, I'm not, I don't call myself a practicing Zen Buddhist, but I enjoy the philosophical teachings of it and the idea of, you know, Ram Dass, be here now, the pres be in the present moment. I find some of that very interesting. Of course. Did you ever think about em embracing a formal uh, religion like uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, uh, 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 any of the Eastern religions? When I, my, after my first psychotic break, I was so taken by my Episcopal priest's um, outreach to my family, his personal support of me as an individual, his care and compassion for me as a being, and his social work uh, that he did outside of his Sunday morning stuff that I thought, I want to be Episcopal priest. I, I went to seminary for a short time. Oh, you did? Oh. I was Roman Catholic. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> Till I started recovering uh -huh. some years ago. I, I'm not Catholic, but the Episcopal, the Episcopal Church has, very, has some similar rituals. One thing I will say about the Catholic Church is I am always amazed at their commitment to serving the poor and to their outreach, uh, to even downtown Portland, some of the work they do with their mission and that part of their uh, commitment to helping those lesser off than us. And I think that that, I think the Catholic Church does an amazing job of uh, trying to do that sort of outreach. I agree, I agree. And how about your formal education? How much of that did you get? I uh, went, made it to the seventh grade, at eighth grade. I was held back in eighth grade, the year of my parents' divorce, because I was absent or not present more than I was uh, present. So I had, in my first year, my first eighth grade the first time, uh, I was not there 51% uh, of the time, so they held us back. So I did eighth grade twice, went into the ninth grade, skipped school most of the time, quit school formally in the middle of 10th grade, and, um, and then ultimately three years later got my general education development certificate. At I'm least. smiling that what you're saying, but it's so similar to mine. Oh, wow. I dropped out of junior high school. Oh, wow. I finally went back to school years later, going forever and ever changing majors, uh -huh. and finally uh -huh. I got a, my PhD. Wow. Similar, yeah. Wow. Uh, and your I have two, a year of uh, community college, particularly focusing on beginning psychology classes, sociology classes, and some uh, first level English composition and math classes, but that's as far as I have gone. Mm -hmm. My long term academic goal was to become an MS, a uh, uh, master's in social work, uh -huh. so I can be under the state of Oregon a qualified mental health professional. But you're not that now. I am not that now. Mm -hmm. I am, by the state of Oregon, I am considered a qualified mental health associate because of the amount of time that I have working in the field as a junior clinician supervised by a qualified mental health professional. Uh, how many years you... Uh, I started working as a qualified... I started working in clinical work in 1994 as a, as a, as a recovery, as a residential associate and then was supervised by a, by a qualified mental health professional and then after three years of supervi clinical supervision then I became a QMHA. The quicker route to become a QMHA in Oregon is to graduate with a four-year degree yeah. in psychology or that related. So, so you got your, your credentials in, in yeah. that way, huh? Yeah, yeah. Like being a part of living and then experiencing and learning that way right. rather right. than the book stuff. Yeah. Okay, uh, 
You have a partner, a boyfriend, girlfriend? I have a partner. I've been with the same person since two, since two, she's lived here since 2004. Mm -hmm. I met her, I was emceeing a mental health consumer conference in Washington, D.C., and I was the, I was the uh, master of ceremonies, and I was, I was the chair of the committee, and she saw me on stage, and she s said that that's when she realized I was the same guy she... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, do you plan to retire? It's hard to say. I'm currently I'm I I'm unim I I'm a volunteer, so I don't yeah. collect wages, yeah. and I work as a peer support person and work in policy. Uh, hopefully, I hope to retire. I hope to uh, channel back some of my work in policy and advocacy and make documentary films. How do you feed yourself? Um, how do I afford to feed myself? Yeah. So I, as I was diagnosed with severe mental health disorder, mm -hmm. in uh, well, when I was 19, and then re, and then diagnosed again, of uh, several times throughout my life. But in 2007, I was awarded Social Security disability uh -huh. for the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Yeah. Do you agree with that uh, diagnosis? I have a cluster of symptoms that would relate to uh, mm. you know, intermittent psychotic disorder yeah. and s some of the things that people with schizophrenia experience, I experience too. I'm not sure I like the idea of the differentiation between what schizophrenia is and what schizoaffective disorder is. And I'm not really sure I like the idea of identifying as one particular diagnostic label. Yeah, DSM, I'm not sure about that anymore. Do you lose touch with reality in a serious way? Uh, I have broken with consensual reality or the, uh, the buy-in of consensual reality uh, dozens of times in my life. Uh -huh. Some more cataclysmic and more chaotic at times. Pardon me, I just slipped my psychologist hat on and that's not fair. I didn't mean to do that. Oh no, it's fine. <laughs> I, I thought I was sitting in, the, in, the, in my office anymore. Thank that's, you for that's accommodating fine. That's me. Fine. I, they, my doctor refers to it, my psychiatrist currently and previously refers to it as psychotic breaks. Yeah. I, my parlance is I like to refer to them as extreme states, extreme states of fearfulness, suspicion, distrust, and uh, emotional despair. Been there. <laughs> I'm going back into me again when I was. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Yeah. I was uh, oh about nine or so when I had the kitchen knife pressed to my solar plexus, praying for what it took to plunge it in mm -hmm. and end it. Mm -hmm. At nine years old. Nine to ten. Wow. Ooh, we so enough of that. Wow. But moved past that a long time ago, mm -hmm. and now nothing serious anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't ask my wife about that, if I've anything serious going on with me now. Right. No, I want mom's the word. Yeah. Right. My lips are sealed, Dr. John. Any children? <laughs> no children. All no right. children, no paternity lawsuits, or no genetic <laughs> testing necessary that I know of. <laughs> but I'm building my social media presence, so maybe I might get contacted someday. For, but no, none at this point. I, I'd had some interest in thinking about ch children, but the blowout of my, uh, ex my, my world experience in the 2001, 2002 changed the course of my life for the next 14 years, and that um, impacted my desire to think about you know, being responsible and raising children. So. Mm -hmm. Would you characterize your political ex uh, persuasion as left, right, center, or what are you... Uh, I, the diff someone called me a liberal. I said, don't call me a liberal. I'm a left-wing radical. Yay! <laughs> Schooled by the likes of Noam Chomsky, uh, Howard Zinn, Cornell West. Those are the people. I didn't know about these people in high school. I didn't know about any of them. I met the man who changed the direction of, I wanted to be an Episcopal priest and then I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I discovered Ralph Nader and some of his issues as a consumer advocate. And he, learning about and reading some of his things and seeing him on the Phil Donahue show impacted my life. Of, I want to be a consumer advocate in the public mental health sector. Like, he, you know, he's the consumer advocate for cars and food and everything. 
I had a, I talked to him for 12 blocks. We walked to the Washington Post. I said, Mr. Nader, I am such a fan. Whoa. Can I have an autograph? He said, young man, I don't, that's silly. I don't, that's for narcissists. I don't do autographs. I don't, that's not about fame. It's about making change. You want to walk to me, with me to the Washington Post? Let's chat. So we walked a mile and a half to the Washington Post. <laughs> you son of a that gun. so cool. I hate you. Yeah, <laughs> so cool. You yeah. sound like you're t you're talking my life story. Oh well, sorry, sorry, yeah, but it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah so I uh, we have the same similar heroes, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, what's the difference between sympathy and empathy? <sighs> it's, that's an interesting question because what is in my the two things that I am formed by this month that's on my plate to think about in my world. One, compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. Two, loneliness, isolation, and shame for the folks like myself but who are not connected to community. For the area about compassion fatigue is the streets and the issue of houselessness and people who are wounded and suffering is at an all-time high. I am an empathetic person. Uh, a conscious person. And, and stop patting your mic. Sorry, so that's a nervous <laughs> habit. I am nervous. You're oh, an intimidating cool. interviewer. You know. <laughs> I, I know how it must feel to go up against Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's flattering. Yeah. So uh, empathy is, em this is just a question, maybe it answers the question, is empathy, I have a, I have maybe had some similar experiences, so I may be able to relate. Um, like the idea of Clinton said, I can feel your pain. And really feel it, you're not just saying Right, it. right, I'm not just saying it so I can, you know, get elected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm not sure what a definition of, I'm sympathetic, my, your cat, my cat Tom just died. Well, I am sympathetic towards your loss. Now, I'm not really sure exactly what the word sympathy is. That shows that, my, you know, spots in my lack of formal education. <laughs> <laughs> For me, that's identifying what's going on with you, what's in my neocortex. But beyond that, it's what's going on in my gut, uh -huh. in my heart, in my soul, so uh -huh. to speak. You know, uh -huh. uh, Compassion, you touched on compassion. That's what it's about, actually, for me, bottom line. Compassion, because un unless we can relate to each other, not as human beings, but as compassionate right, human beings, right. then it's a successful relationship, a successful connection, uh, which makes it all worthwhile, mm -hmm. all worthwhile mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. See it? Okay, I'm, it's, not, not, it's not my show, it's yours. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> fascinating. I like to have a di dialogue. Uh -huh. Memberships in political, social, or civic organizations, I saw your your bio, and you belong to 30,000 organizations. <laughs> <laughs> I participate in an, an awful lot of ongoing and time-limited policy initiatives, councils, and advisory boards related to behavioral health. In Multnomah County, by statute, by law, they have to have an advisory board to advise the county about mental health issues. I participate in that as a person who's a recovering, has a recovering addiction and also a person who lives with a severe mental illness diagnosis and experience of that. To the same degree, the state has p processes that are also advisory councils. So I participate in two or three state advisory councils. Um, some individual health organizations, like for example, Legacy has a new psychiatric crisis unit. I sit on their advisory board. None of these, these are all voluntary, volunteer positions. It's advisory. I'm not a governing board. I'm not a governor it's of any of these processes. I'm not a paid board or director like those on Chevron or Monsanto is. How do they treat you in these positions where you're simply an advisor? I am. I am encouraged, I am always encouraged to continue to speak up and raise important issues. And I am immensely value, uh, appreciate the other stakeholders who say we need to do a better job of reaching out to the recipients and the consumers of these services to make sure we're hitting the target with our service provision to make sure it meets their needs and this is what people want. And you are vocal and you're hyperactive, Kevin and you always have good questions, and um, we enjoy your participation. Do you belong to the ACLU? 
Uh, do am I paying my dues now to the ACLU? <laughs> I, yeah, I, Never mind. I, I, li I am. Uh, I am. Uh, I would be a card-carrying member. I don't know if they want a donation or not. So. I looked at I in my wallet yesterday. I had an AARP card. It said, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. your membership expires 2016. I so. got a bunch of those that are expired. <laughs> it's, it's expired. There are a few that I hang on yeah. through the years. Yep. Like Nader's organizations. Yeah. 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 I'm a member, I don't know if you one could, could I'm also, one of the other things I find great meaning, I'm a participant in the Central Committee of the Multnomah County Democrats and have found great um, uh, joy in associating with the Bernie Krats who are now getting involved and some of their ideas of progressivism and economic reform that is not based on neoliberalism and multinationals running the show and I find that quite exciting. We should have a, a, a chart of our uh, genetic uh, heritage because I think they'd be very similar. Oh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> That's, uh, I also am a participating member of the East Side Democratic Club, which yeah, I always I find amazing. Too. Yes, they're delightful. Yeah, yeah. mostly old fogies. Yeah, but, but it's thinkers, but they great man. questions, great guests. It's always delightful. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. The only drawback about it, the ambiance of the room. Is reminds me of a 1970s, uh, you know, <laughs> church room. Yeah, church room that hasn't been redecorated. And it's just kind of awkward. It's kind of charming. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's and the food makes up for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then also one other thing, more recent, last 18 months, is the greater is humanists of Greater Portland on Sunday morning at the Friendly House. I find and you'll that be fascinating. there next Sunday, huh? Yes. And I'll be there cheering you on. Yeah. I'm a humanist minister, did you know? I didn't know that. Yes. But I find that, spare all the scientific minds in that room and the questions, I find that also quite exciting. If you get up early enough, you can come to the early bird discussion group at that location where the, the main program goes. It starts at uh, 8.45 and goes until uh, 9.45 before the main program starts. We have anywhere from 06 to 12 oh, attendees. Wow. Wow. And these are a special group of people. It's kind of a hybrid sort of a thing. It's like a, an encounter group sort of. Oh, really? But it's a bunch of thinkers uh -huh, uh -huh. and feelers. And of course, with my makeup, I encourage them to go uh -huh, for the gut. Uh -huh, you know. uh -huh. And it's been going on now for years. I organized this so some years ago, and it's been ongoing ever since. Interesting. Wow. So see if you can come over some Sunday morning early. Yeah. And yeah. Part of that. Oh, you'd yeah. be a great addition to yeah. it. The great thinkers there, yeah. and human beings, the human beings. Persons from the past or alive today that you particularly like. You mentioned Jesus is one, and admire anybody uh, from the past or uh, or. Particularly when I was during some of my early extreme breaks or psychotic episodes, yeah. I read the teachings of Thomas Merton mm -hmm. and find that found that very encouraging. Read it over, No Man is an Island, uh, found that very, very encouraging. Um, there, the author who wrote, If You Meet Buddha on the Road, Kill Him, found that his book, The End, uh, growing up, the end of innocence. Sheldon Kopp was psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. That particular book about growing up, maturity, responsibility, impacted me particularly to this day. Um, there's, there's another. I think he's a psychologist who was in, involved in the men's movement. A gentleman named Sam Keen. Oh yeah. I found some of his teaching <laughs> very interesting, and some the book by Robert Bly called Iron John mm -hmm, also very interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As a, as a developing young man, I felt like I was too influenced by the male who was uncomfortable with fragility, tenderness, and pain. And, we, and the idea was that Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone, the macho, never let him see you sweat. Anybody gets in your face, you beat him down, violence. And, you know, and the two feelings you have are horniness and maybe a little bit of laughter. But you don't feel fear, inadequacy, insecurity, uh, compassion for somebody who is lesser than you. I wish that I would, my development was more impacted by an Alan Alda or a Phil Donahue than so impacted early on by uh, the idea of what it means to be a man in the world. Mm -hmm. 
you, you often have so many ideas. I'm going in three or four different tracks at the oh, same okay. time and yeah. trying to choose which uh, one. Well, imagine uh, how hard it is in my own head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my heroes were Jesus, and I'm a recovering Catholic, and Gandhi, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King. Uh -huh. And there's a whole plethora of them now in the past 20 or 30 years, and I've lost track of mm -hmm. which ones in, in some, sort of, some sort of order. But there are Cornell West, mm -hmm. a hero of mine. Mm -hmm. What about Malcolm X? Yes, of course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and his awakening, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I, I mention Cornell West because I often comment that he reminds me of a black version of William F. Buckley. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wow. Did you like Buckley? I enjoyed the firing line because of his spirit. I didn't particularly like his politics, uh, no. but I thought his spirit charming. and his vocabulary and all that was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. so it's a little a sampling of uh, my heroes from the past. Is, a polit is there a, a elected political figure in your lifetime be outside that you can't say FDR, but is there yeah, anyone yeah. in your lifetime a pol elected political figure in the Western world that you uh, identified or would name as a hero? It's kind of funny because Jimmy Carter has turned out to be some sort of a real human human being, mm -hmm. very rare. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to go down that track because mm -hmm. I have so many of those too. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate in having been available to experience a few really beautiful human beings in the true sense of what it means to be a human being mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and loving and embracing other life mm -hmm. on an equal level so to speak i've been accused of being a closet buddhist or something but mm -hmm. I, I always feel flattered uh -huh. when someone accuses me <laughs> interesting the two he wasn't didn't make it to elected office was uh -huh. Robert Kennedy and his uh, yes. his, his metamorphosis not metamorphosis but some of his change later on about the issue of poverty. Yes. Uh, yes. FDR, of course, because uh, you know some of the things that he did with uh, regarding Social Security. He wasn't initially Lyndon Johnson, Vietnam War, and some of those issues, but the impact on Medicaid and the poor. Uh, and the working class and disabled, I, that I'm very thankful that he was in the world that he did. Maybe John F. Kennedy would have, uh, you know, have finished that process, but. And we shall overcome. Remember when Lyndon yeah, Johnson yeah, said that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jimmy Carter, I thought was a, uh, I wasn't, his political skills, I'm not so sure of that. I knew he was super bright when I first saw him on television. And he was far better when I remember Richard Nixon on the TV. Morally, I did. I thought this is a bad actor when I when I was seven years old. <laughs> seeing Richard Nixon you can on TV. Smell him. <laughs> right, right. This guy smells like a crook. So anyway, can we digress for a moment? Sure, sure. What's going on in Virginia? That uh, that town where Robert E. Lee statue, the, the conflict going on there. What, where do the where do uh, Charlottesville where? right? So where here's the question I've been thinking about all day. Where do men who are disenfranchised economically, relationship uh, separated relationship, fractured families, have adverse childhood events that are could make a list of you know up to up as long as my arm of all the adverse childhood events their inability to understand and process their own pain, the idea that give me something to hate gives me some sense of meaning, some connection to the boob tube uh, populist uh, manipulator, I feel like I matter in the reflection of their image upon me. These other things are sublimated or underground or repressed or not talked about. I am wounded, my employment situation, my relationship situation, I cannot relate to the Instagram yuppies or the hipsters. Where am I as a working class white male having value in this culture? My jobs have disappeared, it's a struggle, the relationship's challenging. What do I do with that pain? The opportunity to give me something to hate, to connect and bond tribally with what Bly would say, Oh, here it is. It's the alt-right, and it's these cheaters, these losers, these libtards, and these crooked politicians. Rather than getting at the core, 
greed uh, beyond description. Right. We can't talk about what Sanders was we saying. We need two more hours on this show to cover the stuff that we could enjoy talking about because yeah. we only have one hour. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the stuff that we don't want to talk about. <laughs> but I think that yeah. Sanders got at it. He said, "You're. It's part of this is economic. The economic system and this un." expressed rage of how screwed me as an in poverty or working class is. Sanders is flawed. He is flawed. I have a Democratic I, Party. He's got to disassociate with that term, Democrat, Democratic Party. I thought when I first heard Sanders, I said, you're going to end up knighting the neoliberal Walmart board member, corporate Goldman Sachs speech giver. Uh, you know, who's worth multi-million dollars. All of $220 million Bernie Sanders raised independent, no PACs, to end up knighting the corporate Democratic leader. Yeah. We got this, the director's going to kill me in there if we don't stop. <laughs> Let's take a break, Mr. E. What's the antidote? As a human being in a metro area where suffering, uh, displacement, pain, lots of existential challenges that's out on the sidewalk for you to see in the core area. In employing magic and finding a way to connect in the sense we've been talking about uh, in the past, such that the person is aware that you're empathetic with them and your compassion is working, and then they're available to hear you, mm -hmm. to hear your ideas and your suggestions about what they need to do to take care of themselves such that they're not worn out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's caring for others more than caring for oneself. Mm -hmm. So let's resume with the second half of the show. Okay, very good, very good. I'm frustrated because we, we can go on forever. Well. Okay, so it looks like we're back. Thank you for staying tuned. For your viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like most of you out there, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals, and about whatever it is. We have decided to talk about tonight, and we've decided about talking about other things that weren't on the agenda. And Kevin Fitz is just an absolute delight. <laughs> Thanks again for coming. Thank out. you. Thanks. <laughs> Let's go to the second half. Okay. Okay. I have some notes here, and we're going to talk about. Uh, you had some questions that you just just emailed me about the five myths about peers working in social services. What does that mean, peers working in social services? Say a few words about that, what that means, peers working in social okay, services. Okay, so um, uh, just a, maybe a 15-second background. Whatever. So th I, si I presume that the majority of our audience members are familiar with the idea of Alcoholics Anonymous that got started in the 30s. I think so. And some of the idea that the connection or the kinship of one alcoholic helping another alcoholic sometimes is the... Uh, is the thing that makes is the difference that makes the difference in some situations. One one simple alcoholic helping another alcoholic is sometimes that connection that bond uh, can be uh, life changing and uh, cause meaningful future change. The so the idea and we learned this from the Vietnam War particularly when the vets were coming back 
they connected together in veteran services group and supported uh, each other. Uh, later on with the development of the breast cancer survivors, breast cancer survivors would network together. Uh -huh. So in the area of what we identify as peers is folks that identify in Oregon uh, for state definition as people in recovery from addiction, problem gambling, uh, self-harm issues, et cetera, et cetera, behavioral health diagnosis from everywhere from bipolar to schizophrenia to depression to the, the attention deficit issues, et cetera, et cetera. A person with the experience of this mental health disorder, some people call it the experience of mental illness, mm -hmm. a peer coming to being involved in service provision, not at the clinical side, not like Dr. Don would do and say, you know, you have the problem with your widget A and I give you diagnosis B and C and D, but with the social determinants of health, supportive services, I need help filling out my food stamp application. I am going, I need someone to take me to the social security office because I am getting a review. I need somebody to help me find a new place to live. I need somebody to go help me find some community and some place to go in my community to overcome some of my loneliness and my shame or my fear, of, my fear of the marketplace. Peers are engaged, have been engaged and They've certified. They've been there. They have been there and they have that experience of I was in the psych ward. I have a scar on my leg where they put me in restraints and slapped me down and filled me full of neuroleptics. I have been in the criminal justice system. I have been a problem gambler. I have spent the rent money on lottery tickets. I have drunk myself into homelessness, I, et cetera, et cetera. So those issues, you come and say, you know, I'm a person with these background, this experience of s similar challenges and disorders. You go, the state of Oregon has a process to work as a public, in the public sector to receive Medicaid, to be, have part of your wages paid by Medicaid. You go through a certification process. And the state of Oregon has three particular designations for peers. One is certified recovery mentor, mm -hmm. and the other one is peer support specialist. Mm -hmm. 40 hours of training, of tr actual st uh, formal training, book learning, um, you get you you get a certificate at the end of that. You apply to the state of Oregon and say, "Here is my certificate that I completed this 40 hours training. I want to apply to be a certified peer support specialist or cer certified recovery mentor." On the A and D side, they classify it as certified recovery mentor. On the behavioral health side, peer support specialist. Mm -hmm. You apply. You become. If you go through it, you get a criminal background check. Now that can be challenging because people with, you know, who have some of these issues get tangled up with the law, but they have an appeal process. Fortunately, on the, on the addiction side, we have a private agency that also does certification with the, sta with the state's approval. Are they fairly objective? They, they, the organization, the private organization busts their butt to appeal, to appeal, to approve folks that the state would kick out. And so there's some folks that have criminal justice backgrounds that if the, with the state's process and standards, they might never get approved. But this private agency, um, uh, alcohol, it, I can't remember the actual acronym and he's gonna kick my butt for it, but it's a private agency, it's an organization of alcohol and drug counselors across the state that also does uh, certification for CRM. On the behavioral health side, the state is the only one that does that certification. So you get the 40-hour training, you apply for certification, you go through a background check and to make sure that all your ducks in a row and you become a certified peer worker to be employed in the behavioral health or the alcohol and the, the addictions and uh, uh, services part of the state provision of public, cert public health services. So you go to work, working in Clackamas County at their psychiatric crisis center for doing in-reach to, uh, to jails, to reaching into people who are gonna get discharged soon, to uh, community centers, drop-in centers where peers work and help uh, with you know, the process of so building social community. 
and lots and lots and lots of other things. Why do people like you choose to do this? Have you heard the old adage, the inmates want to run the asylum? Or that place is so effed up, the inmate, it seems like the inmates are running the <laughs> asylum. Look closely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Right. Uh, Who should be the inmate? Never mind. <laughs> it's our conviction, the, our organization, and my conviction that services work best by people who have had some of the experience that oh, the yeah. services, that the services are uh, pres pres prescribed to. Yeah. I don't know. Now it's obnoxious for me to say the words, but I, you have heard the idea that Coke and Walmart does significant surveying and testing of what the customer likes with enough fizz or enough caramel color or they want, you know, gentlemanly, friendly greeters at the front door. They do all this customer service for oh, what yeah. they want on the retail level. To make that money. Well, to make the money, to please the customer. For the longest time in public mental health services, the payer or the customer was identified as Medicaid or Medicare or the county. So it is late in coming that the recipient, the actual person who's getting the services, is also the customer or the consumer. And so we... What about the insurance companies? Yes, the insurance companies. Yeah, well, <laughs> they would like, shh. We think we know best with the uh -huh. consumer, right? Yeah, Hiding. Yeah, yeah, right. You can tell some, in the old ages, the churches used to be the tallest buildings in town. And now it's the insurance companies and the banks. Mm -hmm. So that must tell you about how power has shifted. Uh, into uh, some of these temples. One of my favorite questions is why, uh, 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 what's the answer? Those are my two favorite questions to, to, in situations like this now. But we won't go there because you and I will need four hours. Yeah, right, hours. right, right, right. <laughs> That we believe that the services work best when they're informed by people who have have the, some of the experience of that, and the initial outcomes show less recidivism to the psychiatric crisis ward, less re-entry into the criminal justice system. When you are connected to a peer, when you have a relationship with a peer, you also build more natural sense of community supports. So are not just dependent on your paid helpers who are there from eight to five. Monday through Friday and then go home. Bedside manner. Bedside manner too, right, right. And the sense of bottom oh, line. I don't I people who used to introduce myself themselves to me, I'm 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 a schizophrenic. Well what is your name? Well I'm i I'm schizophrenic. And and the identification with this pejorative challenging box of labels can sometimes be addressed by they told me that was what I suffered with too. But I also found a human being of matter, of worth and importance underneath the DSM-3, 4, 5 insurance classification level that made me feel it was hopeless and my life was meaningless. Powerful. Powerful, yeah. 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 I was talking about earlier in my life how we managed to avoid, even back then, many years ago, that label that I had to live with the rest of my life successfully, but I'm still goofy, so uh -huh. <laughs> I wouldn't change uh -huh. it. <laughs> uh -huh. So where are we now? Um, Can any human being have an extreme state with enough stress and enough challenges and enough uh, financial or relational or existential challenges? Is anybody capable of go be going crazy or getting into extreme emotional despair where they're dark and cloudy and they see no light at the end and of the And the key is how long does it last? Right. How long does it last? Yeah. I think it's, if any human being, could, that could be potentially, they could experience that. Like people who have been imprisoned in, in, in isolation for so long, one individual will go nuts after 36 hours, mm -hmm. and somebody else will spend nine months right. and come out sane, yeah. Yeah. Un, 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 uh, unaffected yeah. by the experience. Uh, shall we address sure. these Let's address them. five myths about sure. peers working in social services? Sure. Peers don't improve outcomes. Anything more to say about that? So the idea that people used to think is, we have to fill the quota. We have to have two peers employed at our community mental health clinic because the state is telling us. But I'm not sure that this is a judicious use of federal funds or public money. And what are they here for except to meet some uh, hiring requirement? Do they produce better outcomes or that we're just doing this because we're told that we do? Peers do produce uh, uh, better outcomes, particularly in the idea. Good data on that. 
Well, it's it's preliminary because we have we're just getting a toe in the game. Only since 2014 have peers been certified to work in community mental health clinics around Oregon. That recent? That recent. Oh, what a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> but we're making up for lost time. Okay. Particularly around the issues of what's already preliminary results are always showing reducing psychiatric crisis. It, the most expensive part of mental health delivery is hospitalization and psychiatric crisis. And there are results already coming in from Clackamas County, who's been a leader in peer service delivery. Clackamas County here in Oregon. Yes, reducing psychiatric hospitalizations, reducing uh, use of hotline services and crisis services after hours, because peer services help the, the, uh, the buildup of the internal locus of choice, control, and self-focus and self-direction, and also connecting with a larger social community. Finally, the person says, I have some sense of what's going on. Right, right. I'm somewhat of managing my own self. And I have friends who I can relate to and don't discriminate against me because they think I'm crazy or wacko. What a lovely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Next one? Next one. Uh, peers will take our mental health professional jobs. Is that true? You guys are... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you saw this, but this was about 10 months ago. There was an agency in either Klamath Falls or Grants Pass that was getting slapped on the wrist because they were promising their qualified mental health professionals a $20,000 uh, signing bonus if they stayed or if they, either they saw, stayed or they continued working with the agency. Because in this rural and frontier area, they were having such a hard time getting qualified mental health professionals down there to do the work. We, uh, in, since 2014, in the employment of peers throughout the Oregon system, we have find no evidence that it reduces the need for clinical uh, for clinical workers at all. And then sometimes it works perfectly in harmony. A clinician feels like he can have a larger caseload if he has peers working on some of the social determinants of health and he can spend his time doing the counseling and doing the, some of the clinical work. Yeah, the pains we go through, those of you like, like us, the, to, uh, arrange the system such that human beings can get things out of the way where they can connect and actively love fellow humans and have the other human be aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my Buddhist community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's oh, tremendous. I, uh, I, uh, if I get into trouble, I'll come see you. <laughs> 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 and I'm careful with my compliments. <laughs> All right. Uh, peers can't work if they have serious mental health issues. So what's the deal? 19 years old, I leave the United States Army training, go AWOL, absent without leave, tried to hang myself twice with a coat hanger off the base, decided these having a severe, suspicious, fearful attitude around the United States military, decided to go all the way out to Oregon, land here in Oregon, end up finally six months, nine months later, serving in Damage State, getting in Damage State Hospital, get put in a group home in the Dalles, told, Mr. Fitz, you're 19 years old, you are going to be incapable of doing enough self-care and self, uh, and taking care of yourself. You will get used to the idea that you will be living in a group home for the rest of your life, and your attitude better adjust because we want you to accept this. And you were medicated at the time? I was highly medicated. Yeah. I was highly medicated. And you move beyond that. Well, they, you said you have. I applied for voc rehab. Said I want to go back to school. I want to get more training as a cook and a chef. Voc rehab is not. You're not eligible for voc rehab because you are too. Because you have severe mental illness, and there is very little evidence to suggest that you will recover from this sufficiently oh, for us geez. to invest. So that was 1984. It's things have changed now. You can live. I, I, I hear voices. I have what the, my psychiatrist calls tactile hallucinations. I hear voices uh, day in and day out, but they don't impact. I'm not working currently. I mean, I'm not paid currently, but I do get, I am engaged in meaningful activity that I'm, some would not think I would be capable of given my diagnosis, which can be like you know a pair of cement boots in the world of success, just because how so much discrimination against the idea that you're you know, that you're a cracked egg and there's no hope. How meaningful can you get? 
<laughs> with I, what you're doing. Well, let's wait till my eulogy and see how it comes over. <laughs> Bless you, my son. <laughs> Thank you. Man, there's some things I'd like to tell you about. Dear Father, I have to feel Mary. I, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> uh, we don't have money to pay for peer services. <laughs> right. Right. So, right. So, this was what came up in legislative session with some of our legislationists. This is going to cost more money. We need in order for and this. And you don't have any right, salary. Right, right, right. <laughs> this is right. But, uh, so, but, so the federal government since 1999 is saying peer services is a Medicaid allowable billable service. So the federal government currently 55 to 60 percent of Medicaid is paid by federal match. So every and it's a it's it's a it's specified eligible service for you if you're a Medicaid recipient and you have a serious behavioral health diagnosis in Oregon. That's a waste of money. We should do away with Medicare and Medicaid. Well, I I want I want a single payer system. Trump. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had nothing to do with that guy. Gosh, boy, oh boy. So a single payer would uh, a, a real single payer would really be. Uh, Incredible. Huh? I agree. I agree. I want a real thing. I want health insurance for everybody. Yeah. I want to take the profit motive out of the exploitation of the consumer. You are anti-capitalist. I'm a I'm a democratic socialist. I'm not. I I I don't know if I'm completely against the marketplace, but I'm against the marketplace of monopoly or galopoly domination. What is the primary consideration in the system? It's not ex ex excluding everything totally except pure socialism. Uh, we don't have many uh, things going on like in Spain. What's the name of that, uh, that socialist experiment that's been going on successfully? Never mind. I'm not thinking about it right now. So, peers can't professional, pro professionally maintain good boundaries. Oh, boundaries, huh? That's an interesting one. Interesting. Please. So can I go to work and have the experience of psychiatric treatment or addiction treatment and know what is, what is, uh, accept, what is acceptable to share and, and be trustworthy and also to have relations to clinical professionals who need to keep confidences and some stuff, it, you're... I go to work as a peer and I'm paid. I'm not there as I'm not your friend. I'm not I can't date you. I I can't you I can't let you sleep over at my house cuz there's professional boundaries. And peers are over and over again are understood that and there are 6 five, there are 450 peers currently working in Oregon and and they 450. understand Yeah, 450. There's probably 1200 that are certified. And there's probably, so there's 600 or 700 would like more jobs, and they would like uh, Governor Brown to continue to fold out this commitment of this is an eligible service that if you have Medicaid, you can get the service. But some of our providers aren't telling you that. When you walk in the door, they're not telling you that you're eligible for peer services. <clears throat> so yes, we find with the right training and supervision, peers can be professional can keep good boundaries, can maintain professional relationships, and also be compassionate, supportive, and humane. Boundaries. Uh, can you say a little more about what you mean by boundaries in the psychiatric or psychological or human sense in our, in our, in our profession? Well, there are certain things that be challenging. If, I, if, some, if my case manager posted on her Facebook page that I am a schizophrenic and I am a recovering uh, drug addict, and that I have been evicted because I acted in a in a an extreme fearful and paranoid break, that would be violating my sense of confidence. Extreme that would be that would be completely violating my sense of my sense of uh, confidence and my trust in that individual. In a community mental health system, you learn things about the person that you're working with. You also learn about what is an appropriate relationship. They told me when I first got my clinical training, this is not about you. You need to put your needs on the shelf, more or less, for the eight hours you're here. You're not here to have a mutual supportive relationship where you talk about, you spend significant time talking about your own pains in detail 
and using them as a sounding board for your life decisions. So boundaries between you and the client or the patient or the person you're working right? with. Right, yes, true. Okay. And also with the people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Do you provide, you know, do you subscribe to certain ethics and standards and ag agreements regarding, you know, the H uh, HIPAA law, electronic transformation of health records and maintain that sort of sense of trust about that? They're going to scream at me if we don't stop Okay. because <laughs> you've got about two, two minutes or so left. Okay. Uh, God, it's been delightful. Been delightful. Uh, <clears throat> you can look at that camera and tell the viewers whatever you want to say to them about anything we've talked about or anything else comes to mind. Go for about 30 seconds or okay. so All right. and just talk to the viewers. Okay. So um, the, the thing that I am formed by, being an individual who has gone through trauma and has uh, recover in recovery and dealing with issues of emotional and addiction and psychotic states, is, uh, is to not give up on oneself and also to dig deeper in the well of the individual that you're dealing with and to never give anybody a sentence of that this is not possible and that you're going to be stuck in this current stasis of your condition and that there's no possibility for your situation to improve, whether you're dealing with a mental health disorder or an addiction disorder. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to challenge everybody, because of the epidemic of our uh, houselessness and the economic situation, there's an awful lot of people out there that uh, causes us to harden our heart because we are approached and impact by it. Yes. So any centering process to help you regain your sense of compassion, your sense that your neighbor is your brother, um, that is so important because I've seen so much callousness and rudeness to folks who are suffering on the streets and in our institutions uh, because people are burnt out and exhausted by the impact on the, uh, the numbers of folks that are suffering. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming Thank you, Dr. On. Don. We have time for a public service announcement or two, my favorite. So, well, thanks for watching. And remember, KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too. And you too, and you too. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good night. <laughs>